America's Heartland is made possible by Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe. Hi, I'm Rob Stewart. If you like a glass of wine with your meals or maybe like to grab a beer at the end of the day, then stick around because we're raising a glass to an important segment of American agriculture. We'll take you to California, where winemakers are taking a different approach in reaching new customers. You'll see how crop technology is helping one winemaker to sweeten your tasting experience. Sharon Vagnan has some ideas that make it easy for you to serve up a very popular dish. And we'll take you to the Pacific Northwest, where turning out distinctive beers is a multi-family effort. It's all coming up on America's Heartland. Up. Cheers. 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 You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man in America's Heartland, living close to the land. There's a love for the country and a pride in the brand in America's Heartland, living close. Close to the land. In recent years, Americans have become a lot more selective about where their food comes from. And we've become much more adventuresome when it comes to trying new foods. And that goes for beverages as well. Just look at the explosion in microbrews when it comes to beer. Barley, hops, wheat, and rice. Heartland grains that go into brewing big name and boutique beers. While beer was once just beer, today we have everything from locale and low carb to imports and flavored malts. And while everyone knows about wine from California, more and more states are seeing winemakers using local grapes to produce award-winning wines. Figures show that Americans will consume, on average, about 12 bottles a year. And what are we drinking? Chardonnay, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Pinot Grigio, and White Zinfandel are high on the wine popularity list. And just as we've seen new innovations that have dramatically increased crop yields for farmers growing things like corn, cotton, wheat, and soybeans, crop research is also impacting those producers who grow grapes and it's being done in a new way that is closer to nature. Ridge Vineyards has been producing award-winning wines for more than a half century. Their historic vineyard spreads across these colorful hills in the Santa Cruz Mountains in Cupertino, California. So we have mostly Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh -huh. We have a little bit of Cabernet Franc, a lot of Merlot, and Petit Verdot. Those four um, grapes all have the potential of going into our top wine called Montebello and a small block of really old Zinfandel that is pre-prohibition. The wines and historic vines here benefit not just from decades old growth, they also benefit from something called biocrop protection, new ways to manage crop cycles using more natural methods and fewer chemicals. On this hot summer day, the grapevines are being sprayed to prevent mildew growth and the potential for rotting. It's high science horticulture developed here. This is the Bayer Crop Science Research and Development Laboratory, where a team of scientists and horticulturists is developing new scientific approaches for farmers to use on crops around the globe. We have a basic discovery. We're looking for new microorganisms to use in crop protection. So we have microbiology, we have chemistry, we have entomology, nematology. As we're developing the process, we have to continue to test that against the target diseases uh, to make sure that, that the activity is continuing. We also need to support manufacturing, uh, make sure that each batch of product meets specifications for the disease control. 
But scientific crop protection and research begins with recreated mini farm fields in these greenhouses. Conditions here simulate what crops and farmers face in the real world of production. It's research that takes time. When one of our scientists goes wow, you know, he, he's working on a bench and he discovers a, a new uh, product to control fungus, say, on apples. From the day that he says, wow, on his bench, it can be up to 10 to 15 years before we can get that to a grower for actual use. We do great number of, of field trials, scientific work to go to the regulatory authorities. In the U.S., it's the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. The crop work here will focus on a number of concerns, things like seed development, crop protection, and pest control. In addition to the focus on science, one of the methodologies that we use um, looks at the, the job of growing a crop, and we break that down into job steps. And what that allows you to do is to understand the efficiencies needed and to anticipate the technology that's going to need it to make a grower more efficient at growing that crop. Those methodologies include research to discover and enhance the naturally occurring defense systems that some plants have. Finding those plant biological protections can impact, even reduce, the need for chemical pesticides. It starts from focusing on the crop that the farmer is growing and figuring out what the best technology is to produce the highest yielding and the best quality crop. So our, our field biologists can take all these different tools and create this unique program for the benefit of our farmers. Scientists say that all of this research is critical to providing food to a growing world population. You hear a lot of time, you know, 7 billion going to 9 billion by 2050. And so those people are going to want a higher protein diet, uh, much like we, we enjoy here in, in the U.S. Uh, and so to feed those people is going to take a lot of technology, uh, and we're excited about it. And as for the work being done in the lab or on the plants at the Ridge Vineyards, it's the potential for new approaches to agriculture that make the difference. I love to see something that I've scaled up or worked on in the lab in small scale, to see it in the big production tanks, to see you know tanker trucks of the product and pallets going out, being distributed all over the world. To me, that's, that's really exciting. Want a little wine trivia? It takes about 800 individual grapes to create just one bottle of wine. Wine is produced in every state in the U.S., even Hawaii, which turns out fruit-flavored wines, some of them made from pineapple. No matter where you live in the U.S. or overseas, it is a good bet that you enjoy wines from California. That's because California produces more than 80% of the wine in America. But even with the lion's share of the country's sales, some Golden State vintners are looking to target new markets for selling their products. Consider the diversity of the winemaking industry. French, Italian, Chilean, and Australian vintners. On the American vineyard scene, uh, this is about three uh, years old. Winemaker Mac McDonald will tell you that African American vintners are not as well known. I travel around the country. I've been to a lot of places, do a lot of wine dinners, do a lot of, you know, uh, charity events. And as I do these charities events, it all of a sudden it dawned on me that there was no African Americans in my audience. That I personally made. Is that right? Theodore Lee owns Theopolis Vineyards in Cloverdale, California, where she grows petite Syrah grapes. Everything. So I want you to try it because try it. it is absolutely a kick. Raised in rural Texas, she wasn't exposed to many wine drinkers till she joined a law firm that employed several vineyard owners. It smells amazing. Today, as an African-American woman successfully conducting wine business, Theo says her heritage presents a whole new point of view to the wine trade. African-Americans, they could get as much pleasure if they knew about the quality of wine. And that's what we're about, educating and making available to the public in at large, but the African-American community specifically. And so as we were going through this thing... Both uh, Mac and Theo uh, belong to the Association of African-American Vintners. Uh, it was founded around members who could come together, create an opportunity for us to talk, 
uh, share resources, and we wanted to also provide an opportunity to educate the public. Uh, primarily African Americans, but not only African Americans, about wine, the wine industry, and what, you know, what the wine industry can do. Max's interest began as a 12-year-old boy on his family's Texas farm. My uh, father was a moonshine maker by the name of Sue, long before Johnny Cash had a song about a man named Sue. And there used to be a bunch of attorneys and doctors and and guys that came out of Houston and Dallas and Fort West Texas to go hunting with my grandfather because he had all these various types of dogs and they would drink my father's moonshine and one of those guys used to drink burgundy. You know if you look at these grapes here next year we'll have a Sampling lot. that well, burgundy have, began a lifelong interest in wine. Today so Mac and his wife Lil have, have realized their dream of, of owning their own world. winery. Uh, a venture into viticulture that puts course. Mac into a in very case, small segment of the industry. African Americans own fewer than 5% you know, of all of the wineries in the have, United States, a statistic the association the wants to change. The fact that we're successful, the fact that we're out here, the fact that people know we're out here, that will increase opportunities and desires of other people to try it, to get in the business and see if they can do something with it. One of the goals of the association is to direct more African-American students into careers in viticulture. Max says the organization offers scholarships and internships as a viable way of changing the face of the industry. The idea is not to have it a black thing, but it's the idea is to get more African-Americans to drink wine. When you bring diversity to the table, what you do is get a different perspective. You get a different approach than what your traditional general population may do. Yeah, I like spicy. I'm a big fan of the spicy. But Recent studies show that spending by diverse groups can have a significant impact on consumer segments of the economy. The association thinks that wine education, targeted marketing, and increased awareness can send more of those dollars to wine sales. We're out here, we're making quality product. We don't make African-American wine. We don't make black wine. We make quality product. Uh, the association is not just around African Americans. The majority uh, wine industry, they love the fact that we're out here. Why? Because it brings wine consumers to them that they otherwise would not have gotten. And just as that taste of Burgundy began the path for Mac McDonald, his goal is to lay the groundwork for the next aspiring winemaker of color. As for the future, I just hope that I can hang on, on long enough to see some African-American male or female tap me on the shoulder and say, oh man, I can make better wine than you can. Californians like their wine. Not only does the Golden State produce more than 80% of the wine made in America, Californians drink a lot of it as well, enjoying on average one of every five bottles consumed in the U.S. There is no doubt that wine's popularity is on the rise across the U.S. You'll find it in more and more grocery stores with a growing number of varieties available. But for that new wine drinker, it can be a little overwhelming. So here's some help, whether you need to pick out a red or a white. Let's start with the names, and boy, there are a lot of them. Some varieties are named based on the area where the grapes are grown. They can also be named after the type of grape, like Merlot or Pinot Noir. From fruity to dry, you've got lots of choices when it comes to taste. You've probably heard white wines with fish and reds with meat, but that basic guideline is not always correct. A better way to think of it is which wine will complement and not overwhelm the flavors of the food that you're eating. A lighter wine goes well with lighter fare. Heavier foods pair nicely with heavier red wines. The good news, new wineries are popping up all over the country with all kinds of new flavors and varieties. And local winery owners are more than happy to field your wine-related questions especially if you buy a bottle or two of their wine. Cheers. The bottom line on wine, if you find a variety and brand that you enjoy, well, you don't have to spend a lot of time worrying about its bouquet or notes of citrus. Hey, you like it, so who cares? 
but you become a wine drinker now and that means you need to experiment a little bit with lots of varieties of wine because you never know which one your palate might prefer. Lots of us enjoy a glass of wine when we dine with friends or enjoy a night out at our favorite restaurant. And we've long paired certain wines with meat or fish. A glass of wine can enhance a meal. And if you're looking for something special to serve with your favorite beverage, well, our Sharon Vaknin is in the kitchen with a main dish recipe that just might fit the bill. Today, it's all about chicken. We're making an old dish new again with two fresh takes on the ingredient. First, it's butterfly chicken with a sun-dried tomato salsa. Then it's honey roasted peanut crusted chicken with a coconut soy dipping sauce. First, let's get started on that roasted chicken. Instead of leaving the chicken whole when we roast it, we're going to butterfly it. To butterfly it, we're going to take out the backbone. And to do that, the easiest way is to use a pair of kitchen scissors. And go right in and cut along the backbone right through the ribs. And the backbone is out. I want to season the inside. And I've already poured out my spices so that I don't have to worry about contamination. Salt, always. Get a nice helping of salt in there. Pepper. And I like to throw in a little bit of fresh minced garlic. You will not believe how juicy this chicken is going to be. The inside is seasoned, so let's get it onto our baking sheet. Flip it right on top of these onions that I've already sliced. And now it's time to season the outside. Salt, ground black pepper, and then I love to add a little bit of sweet paprika just for color and that light, delicate flavor. And before this goes in the oven, I'll drizzle it with a little bit of olive oil to help crisp up the skin. But really, you don't want to use a lot. The skin has enough fat content to crisp on its own. I just need to go wash my hands and then this will go in the oven at 450 degrees for about 30 to 35 minutes. With the chicken roasting, let's work on that sun-dried tomato salsa. All we need are a few vine tomatoes and we'll give them a good dice. Diced tomatoes go in the bowl. Then we'll add our minced garlic, sun-dried tomatoes in oil, chili flakes, fresh ground black pepper, salt, and basil. For the basil, I'll just roll them up and run my knife right through those leaves. Give this a stir and our sun-dried tomato salsa is done. Our chicken's roasting and our salsa's ready, and now it's time to work on our honey-roasted, peanut-crusted chicken thighs. This recipe is really simple, and it's a lot like making a regular breaded and fried chicken. But this time, we're adding honey-roasted peanuts that goes in a Ziploc. And we'll add panko breadcrumbs into the mix. Make sure all the air is out. And I'll use a rolling pin to crush up those peanuts and make sure they stick to the chicken. Now we'll grab our tray. Pour that in there. It smells so good. Now we need our liquid. So I've got one egg. And instead of milk, we're using coconut milk. It's a lot creamier and it'll add that nice hint of flavor. We'll also add a little bit of fresh black pepper. Now we can bread our chicken thighs. Just dip it in our coconut and egg right in there. Pat it down to make sure it has a nice coating. We'll just repeat the same process for all of the cuts. Our chicken thighs are all crusted and they're ready to be fried. I have some oil heated up in this cast iron pan, great for frying. We don't want to crowd the pan too much. We want to give them enough room to breathe and we don't want to cool down the oil too much. While that fries, let's work on our coconut soy dipping sauce. It's very simple. We just need a few ingredients, starting with soy sauce. 
That goes right into a pan. Then we'll add our coconut milk, a little bit of chili garlic paste, and finally, honey for sweetness. Now we'll bring this mixture to a boil and we'll let it reduce for about 20 minutes or until it's about half in size. You know the thighs are ready when both sides are nice golden brown, but don't be afraid to take it off the heat and cut into it with a knife to make sure that meat is white. That looks pretty good. Our last chicken thigh is done, and by now, our butterfly chicken should be ready, and both of these dishes are ready to be served. With our butterfly chicken, every inch of that skin is crispy. Then we have our honey roasted peanut crusted chicken with a coconut soy dipping sauce. It's sweet, it's salty, and it looks beautiful. With these two fresh takes on the ingredient, you get big, bold flavors in every bite. I'd call this a winner, winner, chicken dinner. While we talk beverages made from heartland crops, we can't overlook beers and ales. Specialty beers have given rise to a large number of small breweries all across this country. Different ingredients and regional taste impact the kinds of beers being made. And that's certainly true for one small brewery in Oregon, where our Jason Schultz found that beer making is a multi-family endeavor. Things are heating up in Silverton, Oregon. So we got uh, full 45, 48 gallons in here. We're going to boil off. Phil Knowles' small batch of Maggie's Marzen wouldn't taste good in a mug right now. It's going to take some time, and there's a key ingredient yet to be added, hops. Hops are vital to any beer. And Phil would know. His day job is actually teaching high school chemistry. But here, he's the head brewer at Seven Brides Brewing. What do good hops do for the beer, though? What is it, how does it impact the, the taste of the beer? Okay, the, the taste of the beer, the hops supply the bitterness. Seven Brides Brewery was founded a few years back after five guys spent their Saturdays brewing various beer batches in their garages. We were brewing five gallons at a time, then it went to 10, then it went to 30 and 40, and it's like, okay, guys, if we're going to do this, let's do it right. And before long, they were doing just that. Now five friends who come from different backgrounds, marketing to engineering to chemistry, are running their own beer biz. And so far, so good. They will sell upwards of 6,000 barrels of beer around the region this year. Our business model is not to grow the business, to get it as big as, it, as we can and then sell it for profit. Um, our goal is to build a company that we can hand down to our daughters uh, and have them step in and run it. More on just how important those daughters are in a moment, but to find another key ingredient to the Seven Brides' success. Go, oh, here we come. You'll have to visit nearby hops farmer John Annan and hear the story about the refrigerator the guys were trying to sell online on Craigslist. So I put an ad on Craigslist and lo and behold, Johnny called looking for a refrigerator and we had one and it was too big and you know, one thing led to another. He came up, we were chatting and realized that he was a hop farmer. And he says, what are you gonna do with the refrigerator? I said, well, we need it for hop samples for our brewery, but for the little brewery guys. Brewers meet longtime hop grower in an amazing moment of serendipity. I grew up here, Johnny grew up here. We're five miles apart and I'd never met before. Never met, never had any idea. Turns out most hop growers here sell to large brewers, but John Annan was more interested in direct sales to guys like Jeff. Because it's really fun working with these guys. They're real, honest, hardworking, good people. And how about from a grower's perspective? I mean, you know, hops is in your blood. Hop grown is in your blood, <laughs> yeah, right? I was born into it. Yeah, That's I don't right. know anything else. So. And so to see that satisfaction on their faces must be pretty rewarding. Oh, man, it's, it's like the best thing in the world. Back at Seven Brides, it's time for those all important hops to be added to the brew. Dump those in. All right. Sprinkle them in and... And these are from John Annan's place just down the road, right? John Annan's place just down the road. Ooh, smell good. And out front in the tap room restaurant, they're serving up their brews and grub. At one of the tables, the brewer's namesake, the Seven Brides. Well, someday anyway, 
Back when the guys were thinking about starting this business, they had seven little girls, daughters and nieces, who might someday need expensive weddings. So that got brought up one afternoon. It's like, well, if we're going to do this, we might as well earmark some funds for it. And so that's kind of been kind of become one of our taglines is, you know, we've got seven daughters and seven weddings to pay for. It's not every little girl who gets a microbrew named after her, and not every group of buddies who get to turn a hobby into a successful business. You know, I, we, we got to tell people, we make beer for a living. Cheers. 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 We know that we pass along a lot of information to you in every program, and in case you miss something or you just want to check out videos from this or other shows, we make it easy. Just log on to our website at americasheartland.org. And you'll find us as well on some of your favorite social media sites. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you next time on America's Heartland. You can purchase a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this program. Here's the cost. To order, just visit us online or call 888-814-3923. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man In America's heartland Living close to the van There's a love for the country And a pride in the brand In America's heartland Living close Close to the land America's Heartland is made possible by Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe.